going on way back since uh, 1990 early 1990 uh, in fact it was 22nd december 1989 when the united nations declared an international decade for natural disaster reduction from january 1st 1990 to 31st uh, december 1999 Uh, during which various uh, uh, initiatives were done, and one of the major initiatives which were taken up was the first World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction, which was held at Yokohama in Japan, and we came out with a strategy called uh, Yokohama Strategy for a Safer World. And that part of the strategy, there was a recommendation and emphasis on establishing uh, dedicated centers. on disaster management because till then there were no subject on disaster management in the universities or in the training institutions so government of india at that time it was uh, ministry of agriculture and farmer welfare uh, which was uh, the nodal ministry uh, they established in march 1995 a national center on disaster management at uh, indian ministry of public administration new delhi and also started with the center sector scheme through which they established the disaster management cells and centers at the various administrative training institutes as well as the state institutes of rural development where our provisionally uh, officers from the state provincial services and the central services were being trained so uh, we started with that uh, initiative and later on it was realized that uh, this subject is much uh, having broader perspective than what was and we said earlier uh, that it's not only the droughts famines floods uh, which are to be dealt with there are earthquakes landslides lightning and uh, many other disasters which uh, including the tsunami which are affecting our communities so therefore in uh, 2002 uh, this subject uh, was transferred to ministry of home affairs immediately afterwards in october 2003 this national center on disaster management was upgraded on 16th october 2003 as national institute of disaster management and uh, this national issue of disaster management later on uh, also uh, served as uh, the national institute uh, through the disaster management act 2005 as a statutory body uh, the act uh, 53 of 2005 was notified on 23 december so uh, these developments took place and while these developments were taking place Uh, there were a lot of consultations going on which were being held by the high power committee which was constituted in 1999 and which submitted its report in 2001 and later on uh, after the enactment of uh, this uh, act the establishment of a national disaster management authority under the chairmanship of none other than the honorable prime minister of the country and also the establishment of uh, the national disaster response force so uh, the national level institutions were established and also the state level institutions in terms of state disaster management authority and also the state disaster response force and uh, to the district level the district disaster management authorities so we got uh, the uh, institutional mechanism we got also the funding mechanism Uh, through the disaster management act as well as through the various uh, finance commissions right uh, from the 6th 7th uh, finance commission up to the 15th finance commission there have been some provisions uh, with focus on disaster management activities and the 15th finance commission in fact also highlighted the need for uh, the disaster mitigation and disaster capacity building Uh, funds as well so these uh, were not only the response funds uh, as allocated to the 15th finance commission but also the capacity building funds and the disaster mitigation funds by the 15th finance commission so funding mechanisms were there the institutional uh, me- uh, provisions uh, mechanisms were also established 
Now the uh, next was the action plans to be taken up. I told you in 1994, we had the Yokoma strategy. It was followed by the Second World Conference on a decadal basis in 2005, from where the Yogo framework of action on DRR emerged. And the last third uh, conference was held from 14th to 18th of March uh, 2015 at Sendai. Sendai, you know the place where the tsunami had taken place on 26th December uh, 2004 in the Indian Ocean. Oh, sorry, uh, 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 Sendai is a place where on 11th March 2011, that uh, tsunami, uh, the triple disaster has happened. Uh, I mentioned the Indian Ocean tsunami, but uh, the Sunday was chosen as uh, one of the places for the Third World Conference as the uh, Sunday uh, was one of those provinces, uh, places in Japan where the tsunami along with the earthquake and the nuclear disasters happened in those areas. So triple disasters uh, was one of the reminders and from where the Sendai framework on disaster reduction has come up. So now from 2015 to 2030, we are following the Sendai framework on disaster risk reduction. And uh, also in 2015, we had two other major agreements that were the uh, in September, the 17th Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, in November, December, we came up with the Paris Climate Agreement. So all these three agreements were amalgamated. And uh, during the first post Sunday Asia Ministerial Conference at New Delhi, in the inaugural address from 3rd to 5th of uh, November, Honorable Prime Minister actually gave that 10-point agenda on disaster risk reduction. So we are taking these steps forward as per uh, the recommendations uh, uh, by the Honorable Prime Minister under the 10 point agenda on disaster risk reduction and also as per the mandate given by the disaster management act 2005 and following the principles and the uh, guidance given under national policy on disaster management which was released in 2009 uh, besides this a uh, lot of uh, national guidelines have been issued by our National Disaster Management Authority on uh, specific disasters as well as specific operational and functional aspects of disaster management. So there are many things to be taken care and taught to the students in order to mainstream disaster risk reduction and resilience with all kind of uh, dis uh, developmental activities and also looking into uh, the uh, emerging threats because of the changing climatic conditions, urbanization, population growth, and rapid rate of uh, developments, we have to actually engage all uh, stakeholders into uh, disaster risk reduction and resilience uh, activities. And uh, youth are uh, one of the most uh, enthusiastic, energetic, and uh, enriched uh, group of uh, society who, if they join, can actually strengthen our endeavors in disaster risk reduction and resilience. So with these kind of uh, programs, I hope uh, we will be able to uh, support and nurture the culture of risk assessment, prevention, mitigation, preparedness, and efficient response, as well as a uh, quick recovery in all our uh, disaster situations and also we will uh, be able to meet the challenges of the emerging threats from the new uncertain unexpected and untimely disasters as well so we have to visualize the worst case scenarios and take adequate steps and practice ourselves well so that we act rightly at the right time at the right place in a right manner and we are able to reduce the risk and enhance the resilience of our communities affected by disaster situations with that word i would say that uh, we have begun our journey towards disaster risk reduction and we have to continue this 
uh, till uh, we are able to achieve our goal of the national policy that is the zero casualty, disaster free and resilient nation. And uh, this would be a dynamic process and a continuous integrated mainstream process that has to be sustained through our efforts. So I would say that we need to change our perspectives from the reactive piecemeal ad hoc approaches to disaster management then towards the uh, proactive, continuous, uh, and uh, also uh, integrated and mainstreamed approach uh, with all inclusive and ecosystem based disaster risk reduction. This is Shaya Nekai, can other Badlo Nejare Badal Jangi, Soch Badlo Sitare Badal Jangi, Kastio Kubadal Neki, Jurutni Yaru, Disha Badlo Kinare Badal Jangi. So we have to actually change our attitudes, perspectives, and uh, make our will and stance and attitudes. Uh, towards risk reduction and resilience, as we have shown in the current pandemics, uh, and uh, try to contain and control it well. So, with these words, I thank you for this opportunity. Back to you, Dipali. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words, and we are really thankful to you for your sharing our expertise with our audience. As Sir rightly said, disaster management is important because it aims to ensure an effective and coordinated response to the disasters. And the online courses or the webinars or the training sessions are first of its kind in India, which help different users to acquire knowledge based in the subject. And these programs include discussion, queries, cl clarification, and, and end of course projects which are evaluated. So with these words, I uh, urge the audience to kindly raise your queries and questions uh, with our speaker so that we can make the sessions interactive. So before proceeding ahead, we, uh, I would like to request for this special address, uh, Professor Venkati Dutta. For introducing Professor Professor Dutta, I would like to say something. Uh, for this special address, uh, we were supposed to have Professor Sanjay Singh, Vice Chancellor, BBAU, but because of some urgent meeting, he suddenly left out of uh, town. So we are having, we are obliged to have Professor Venkati Dutta to uh, give this special address to our audience. So before calling Professor Dutta, I would like to uh, introduce him. Professor Dutta is a sustainability practitioner and a thought leader specializing in natural resource management, environmental flows, water quality, river restoration, urban environmental planning and climate policy. He has contributed to significant changes in public discourse, law, and policy for environmental sustainability and natural resource management in India. He has about 20 years of professional experience in areas of land use and zoning regulations, catchment planning, river restoration, and eco-hydrology. He is a Fulbright Fellow and a British Shevning Scholar. He is a Professor of Environmental Sciences and Head of Civil Engineering Department at BBAU Lucknow. So we are highly obliged to have you serve with us. So I kindly request you to take over the virtual stage and please address our audience with your special address. Over to you, Professor Ratta. Professor Ratta, are you there? Professor Dutta? Sir, am I audible to you, Professor Dutta? I think we are having some technical glitch. Uh, Professor Datta, uh, are you able to hear us? Yes, yeah, sorry audience, uh, just a few seconds or minute more. Uh, how to call Professor Arta.
Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. I think yes, there is some problem audible. with the bandwidth. You know, suddenly the screen disappeared, so I missed the last uh, two three minutes. It's completely okay, sir. Uh, you may proceed, sir, with your special address, sir. Okay. Sir, in case of the bandwidth issue, you may turn off the video so we can hear the audio clearly. Right. In case of the so I hope I am audible now. Yes, sir. Oh. Audible and uh, visible both. Right. So thank you very very much, uh, Professor Haldar, to uh, for giving this opportunity to uh, you know collaborate with our university, and it is indeed a great pleasure to work together on an issue which is very close to my heart and also uh, to the entire scientific community working on disaster management. And I must uh, thank Professor Suri Prakash ji for setting the context. Uh, this. Uh, you know, theme is quite topical these days. You know, we are having a series of disasters, uh, especially the flood disasters. A uh, lot of Western disturbances is coming and uh, the rainfall was also quite, uh, you know, quite erratic uh, for the last two, three years. Uh, in uh, If you see the pattern of the South Asian monsoons. So uh, this uh, inaugural talk was supposed to be given by my vice chancellor, but he was uh, he's traveling these days and he's uh, attending some meeting at UGC. So I'm speaking on his behalf uh, just to uh, give you some idea why we are doing this uh, workshop together. You know, a lot of uh, uh, disasters, especially related to rivers, are happening from the uh, from the fragile mountainous regions of the Himalayas. And uh, Himalayas, they have uh, the entire range of Himalayas. Uh, they witnessed a series of natural disasters over the last uh, two, three decades, if you could see if, if our collective memory is very strong, then we could also recall that the all these states, the Himalayan states have a, a history of natural disasters such as landslides and forest fires and cloud bursts and flash floods. So these are becoming more sort of a common phenomena, you know. And even the earthquakes, earthquakes have been more devastating and more unpredictable. And what is alarming is that uh, instead of uh, addressing the cause uh, that led to disaster or increase the magnitude, we are still uh, developing very heavily in the fragile environments, which are very much prone to the high impact uh, earthquakes and flash floods. So, it is a very perfect recipe for inviting natural disasters. You know, the disaster prone hilly states such as Uttarakhand and Himachal Pradesh, they have suffered from severe natural calamities in the last uh, 20, 30 years. If you could recall the June uh, 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 13 flash floods in Uttarakhand, one of the worst natural disasters which claimed the lives of uh, thousands of people and uh, even livestock. So massive construction project in in a very ecologically sensitive area could amplify such damage. You know, if you could recall, it was in the month of June uh, 2013 that we had very widespread heavy rains, uh, which resulted in uh, uh, a severe flood across the state, which claimed thousands of lives and, and the damage was worth uh, billions of rupees. So the main reason behind such disaster could be the widespread uh, number one, the heavy rains, uh, which led to flash flood in all the uh, major river valleys in Uttarakhand. And uh, there are also uh, landslides, which are caused by the heavy rains at various locations. So even the NIDM prepared a report, uh, the Kedarnath tragedy report. And according to this report, if you read it, the uh, entire area was worst affected, where the heavy rains led to the collapse of the, uh, the Chorabari Lake, you know and which resulted in the release of a huge volume of water uh, that caused another flash flood in the Kedarnath town, leading to further devastation in the downstream areas. So more than, uh, I think, uh, 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 9 million people, they were affected, you know? 9 million means 90 lakhs. 90 lakhs people were affected due to flash floods, and the most affected districts were uh, the Chamoli, uh, Bageshar, uh, Pithodagard, then you had Rudraprayag, then Uttarkashi. So these are the regions which are also getting a lot of important uh, uh, pilgrimage circuits, right? And the disaster took place uh, during the peak tourist season, right? When we had this Chardam Yatra, 
so thousands of people were killed and many were missing and many villages were washed away many cattle were lost the houses were damaged so such type of uh, disasters are becoming a common uh, you know becoming more common these days uh, because flood plains are being heavily encroached habitations are coming infrastructure projects are coming during uh, in the uh, in the river valley many large dams are being built in in a very fragile atmosphere without uh, learning any lessons from the past right so if you see the dams on the upper reaches of the ganges uh, we have tributaries like mandaki bhagirathi and alaknanda and the magnitude of disasters in such regions are so high uh, that the amplitude the 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 uh, the uh, impact of disaster on the ecosystem if you convert into monetary terms could be huge because we don't yet uh, have the capacity to calculate the loss of ecosystem processes loss of river systems loss of entire ecology right so such uh, projects if you uh, see uh, the uh, the kind of uh, you know disaster such as earthquake in uttarkashi and chamoli 99 earthquake then there were series of landslides and cloud bursts and flood events uh, in okimart and gona and khetgaon so uh, bhatwari and uttarkashi so many such uh, uh, disasters happened in the uh, the the sensitive zone and just if you recall the rainfall of uh, uh, just last week only uh 16 to 17th october in kerala many of the rivers were flowing higher than their high flood level historic high flood level they crossed it and uh, again the uh, the flood disaster of uttarakhand uh, which happened during february 2021 this year uh, in the nanda devi national park you know the garhwar himalayas the entire burst of the glacial lake lot of glacial out uh, what you call the glof the glacial lake outburst floods are happening and it is causing flooding in the downstream areas such as the chamoli district and uh, if you recall the entire rishi ganga river the dholi ganga river and in turn the entire alaknanda river which is the major head stream of the ganges so because of this disaster around around uh, 200 people were killed and many of them were missing many of their uh, many of them were workers at the tapovan dam sites so we are going to have more such disasters if we do not learn from our previous mistakes we if we do not learn to become proactive if we do not take the integrated and ecosystem and inclusive approach as it, it was pointed out by professor suri prakash and there's a added uh, layer of threat on to the already stressed himalayas that is the climate change you know the himalayas had been warming at a very dangerously high uh, rate and the entire region's ecosystem has become uh, too physically exposed to the dangers of these uh, development projects be it the widening of the roads or the dams or the river valley projects so i won't uh, take too much of time uh, i have a separate uh, you know presentation with you uh, uh, in uh, one of the lectures uh, so so to conclude uh, i look forward to uh, hearing from all of you let's make this entire workshop more interactive there are many good speakers uh, we have uh, dr suri lakshmi sri lakshmi and then we have uh, uh, professor abhijit mukherjee who is a renowned professor he got shanti swarup bhatnagar award last year for his work on the ground water uh, systems so all the uh, lectures are very quality lectures the professors and the experts are quite acclaimed so i hope uh, your time here would be quite fruitful and uh, feel free to uh, uh, you know raise your doubts and come back to us thank you so much thank you so much sir thank you for your excellent inputs on various disasters you have mentioned and it's true that valuable information which is gathered during the hours days or months or years following a disaster can lead to policies in the practice and hence it helps in reducing the risk that is very much important in terms of loss of life property and natural resources so thank you once again uh, sir for joining and uh, delivering a special address to our audience thank you so much
So heading towards our technical session now, I take the opportunity to invite our first speaker. She is P. Shri Lakshmi. Uh, she is having the qualification of Master of Science in Information Technology. She has been designated as Scientist SF and Head Emergency Database Service Section. He, uh, she has an overall experience of 20 years in satellite data processing and disaster management spanning the areas of image processing, relational database management systems, GIS, that is geographic information system, and analytics skilled in defining and implementing various components of a web application, such as web interface design, database design, and business logic. She is currently responsible for implementing national database for emergency and management project at the behest of Ministry of Home Affairs. The work involves database integration, organization, and development of decision support system tools, hosting, and dissemination of the services to state as central disaster management authorities to aid in relief and rescue operations during the disaster emergency situation. So with these words, now I hand over the stage to uh, Sri Lakshmi Ji, ma'am, uh, to kindly address the audience with her presentation. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. I have given, uh, given you the presenter rights also, ma'am. You can share your screen. Yeah, thank you. Is a uh, yes, ma'am. Your screen is uh, visible. Yeah, thank you. So next slide. So uh, good morning, everyone. Today is the topic is of mine is a national database for emergency management. Uh, basically, the main aim of this NDM is to have a generic database for entire country uh, to cater to both man-made and natural disasters, basically. So the main aim is after the tsunami, uh, the government of India has uh, coined this concept. Uh, basically, instead of reactive, we need to have a proactive system for disaster risk reduction. So the, the first and foremost objective of this is to have a generic database for entire country. So the generic database basically to have one single place, the entire database, whether it could be uh, administrative boundaries or it could be disaster specific layers or it could be hospital database so to have at one single place so that it is reduce the turnaround time and in relief and rescue operations and in planning so the database will not be available at one single place so we need to uh, gather the database from various state governments and central governments and if required from the private parties also and bring it in com uh, some common platform and integrate it and keep it at one single place so that during the emergency situations, so the uh, disaster specific DMs and other people of, uh, can directly access this database. So once the database is ready, users cannot directly access this database. So we need to develop such, uh, develop such decision support system tools, uh, either it could be proximity analysis or network or evacuation plans, so that we have developed the, some decision support system tools and we have developed a geo portal called NDEM. And this geo portal is accessible by all the state and central government departments. And to disseminate this information, so we have uh, uh, established a computer set up part infrastructure at NRSC Sharnagar. So in uh, near future, uh, soon we are going to have an integrated control room for emergency management ICRER at New, New Delhi. So that will become a main site. And the site at NRSC will become a DR site. So this is in nutshell about NDEM. Uh, next. So who are all the stakeholders of this NDEM? So we do have categorized into five categories. First, we have uh, we are implementing this project on the, at the behest of Ministry of Home Affairs. So the monitoring departments we have MHA, NDMA, uh, PMO, and ADM for policy decisions and guidelines. And we do get the data from the forecasting departments from CWC about threats and IMD about cyclones and other weather uh, parameters, inquiries about storm surge and passage in Tigre of Tabalanque. Like this, we do get the data from forecasting departments. And relief and rescue forces, NDRF, and SDRF are also part of our uh, user database. And uh, all the state disaster uh, departments and district disaster departments are all the main users of this NDEM. So as I told you, the very first version was launched in 2013. After that, with the so many improvements for almost every couple of uh, years, we are uh, 
evaluation uh, based on the user feedback and all we are improving of the portal and the latest version is the version 4 which we are launched in 2021 so now it is coming to that what kind of a data we do disseminate from the uh, ndm portal the very first thing is uh, india even though we have so many disasters uh, hydrometeorological uh, disasters are the more uh, this thing 70% the disasters occur due to hydrometeorological disasters. So that's why we do have the information uh, like uh, from cloud movement from IMD and uh, RINSAR series. And we do have a data from CWC uh, about warnings and forecast. And we do have cyclone track information from IMD also. And uh, apart from that, we do uh, disseminate the near real time disaster specific products uh, which are generated in NRSC. And those are also disseminated. And we do have a city weather forecast and all this information we do compile and keep it at one single place so that the user need not lose time in uh, uh, reaching uh, knowing about the information about the disasters. So at one single place, the entire data will be available. Apart from that, we do gather information from the news channels and apart from that and um, social media tweets also so that the, all the information is made available at one single place. Next. So, as I was telling, uh, uh, first, uh, apart from the alerts and forecast, this thing at NRSC, we do have a disaster management support division. So, where we continuously monitor during the April to December, that is the monsoon season, the fuel reverend flooding. So, which uh, usually happens due to silt deposits, uh, deposition or drainage congestion or, or the sedimentation causing due to heavy rains. So, uh, we continuously monitor this. Uh, one is the, the triggering point is based on the CWC alerts uh, from the gate station uh, uh, readings. That is, they give uh, disseminate the data in uh, three uh, levels. That is, uh, above normal level, severe level, or extreme uh, level. So this is this is one of the input for us for uh, triggering the event. The second thing is from the cloud uh, moment information also, and from the news or social media tweets. So we gather the information and we, according to the uh, severe, uh, severity of the situation, we do uh, plan the satellite data acquisition. Usually we prefer the microwave uh, SAR data because of its uh, penetration to the clouds and all. So here, uh, generally nowadays, we do uh, depend on sent sentinel, uh, sentinel data, radar SAR data, or NOVA SAR data. We do acquire the satellite data. After that, after rectification and uh, doing other uh, processing this thing, uh, based on the, uh, we apply the thresholding and we extract the uh, water layer from that. And apart from that, uh, we uh, get the flood inundation layer. And on that, we do uh, overlay the administrative boundaries and final flood composition map composition is done. And uh, from this, we can find out what is the extent of the flood and how many districts or the villages got affected. And we estimate the damage statistics from that. So this data, the final layer is distributed through the users, uh, through email and well as through our portal, web portals also. And it is, will be uh, along with that, it is uh, coupled with SMS alert also, the com uh, concerned uh, district uh, uh, authorities or the state government authorities will get an SMS alert also. So this is in total net flow during the monsoon season, the entire uh, proactively NRSA will monitor the flood situation across the country and flood maps are uh, prepared. So here, uh, the, how the sample flood map uh, looks like uh, for the floods in River Ganga and, and the Bihar. Next, please. And this is how that uh, flood in Kerala, the part of Kerala, the recent floods which are occurred in the Kerala, this is how the map shows uh, the Cyan color shows the flood inundation area. And here, the right side, you will get the information of what kind of uh, satellite data is used uh, and which kind of sensor is used, what is the resolution, and when what when the observation are made, what is the date of that, and the legend also is this information is made available to the user in near real time. So this is how our uh, NDM dashboard looks like. So the, the moment you type ndm.nrsc.gov.in, so you will get all the information about uh, uh, the uh, alerts and warnings or the information which is available in the dashboard. So the right side uh, part, you will know the current disaster specific news, which we gather from the social uh, news channels, authorized news channels. And the very first tab here is a near real time flood layer. So here, if you click that, so you can select the state. Suppose if you select Assam. So the last uh, flood layer was uh, that is on uh, 
6 September uh, 2021. So around 18 hours, how the flood is occurred in around the Brahmaputra River, the Sayan this thing shows the, the flood extent and like that. So whenever, as and when the flood layers are uh, generated, immediately it will be uh, disseminated through our portal. So users can directly have access to these flood maps so that it will be useful for them for relief and rescue operations or from the planning operation. So now recently we have Uttar Pradesh floods also. So the latest uh, layer was of 21st October 2021. This is how the flood layer looks like. Yeah. Similarly, once uh, down when you see the flood layer disaster event card here, so what are the past 30, 60 days, what are the disasters have occurred across the country? It need not be only flood, it can be of any disasters. Those will be displayed here. For example, for the UP flood, so we have one layer and once this thing, the flood inundation map also in the form of PDF, you can see. Here the layer is displayed here also and you can download the inundation map also. So this information is made available along with the, your infrastructure layers, rate road layer and administrative boundaries. All this information is made available at one single place. Go back to our... Yeah. So apart from that, uh, uh, normal during the flood season, we do monitor uh, uh, the transboundary rivers also. So in the year 2008, the Kosi River, where the breach has occurred in the part of Nepal, these are continuously monitored and uh, uh, totally three districts were inundated for more than a month. So we uh, updated the information using the space-based inputs, continuous satellite data monitoring is being done, and information was given for every three to four days. So this is one of the uh, flood response, what do we carry out? Next. So here, uh, during this time, we have prepared the progression maps, the recession maps, and flood persistent maps also. So how many villages got under flood uh, for more than a month? That information was given. Very close monitoring was done for the Kosi floods. And uh, uh, based on the landscape of the transboundary rivers, uh, San Koshi River in the, this thing got uh, occurred, landslide occurred in the uh, year 2014. So using the multi-temporal satellite data, the analysis has been carried out. So, and so that uh, this has helped in the government so that to avoid major disasters in the Bihar. So like that, apart from the routine, this thing, we do monitor uh, the uh, breaches which are occurred or based on the landslides, what kind of a inundation is going to be occurred. This continuous monitor is also being carried out by NRC. Yeah, so having the database of continuous monitoring, we do have a rich database of more than two decades. So based on that, we have prepared the flood hazard zonation atlases. So based, this is basically based on the frequency of occurrence and based on the spatial extent of the flood. So we have uh, prepared Assam, Bihar, and Odisha states using the multi-temporal and historic satellite data. And the flood hazard zonation for Andhra Pradesh, uh, Bihar, we have completed. We are waiting for its release also. So and it is in the Uttar Pradesh, it is in the process of preparation. So. This is for the Assam uh, flood hazard donation. We have used more than 215 multi temporal satellite data sets and we have updated this atlas for twice. And uh, from this, we can find out uh, which areas got frequently inundated and what is the uh, uh, severity of this uh, flood hazard donation. And similarly, for Bihar uh, state, we have used more than 128 multi temporal satellite data, this thing. And uh, for 1998 to 2010, uh, these data sets were used and the flood hazard. Uh, um, uh, atlas was generated. So this atlas you can see in the uh, in kind of uh, in our uh, portal also. So when you click on the flood hazard donation maps, so you can select the state here. So for example, uh, Assam. Yeah. So here you can find out what is the uh, extent of the, uh, this thing, and you can see the legend also, which is very high, moderate to very low, and the fry categories. So the hazard has been categorized, and you can select the district also. Yeah, district wise uh, hazard also you can see, and you can view the statistics also. Yeah, so you can see the statistics uh, depending upon the very low and high. So how how the districts got affected is also you can find out from Dubri district. So apart from that, we do have aggregated flood maps wherein uh, the frequency of uh, floods is not much, but we do have some historical data. Based on that, we have prepared the flood uh, aggregated flood maps also. For example, Kerala. Yeah. So using the past uh, 20 years data, where based on the 
occurrence of the here you can find out uh, the blood occurrence in the cyan color for this uh, we have uh, generated this aggregated map for six states and so this is basically near term blood mapping is uh, during the blood uh, uh, season and during the incident is occurred and the blood hazard diagrams are basically meant for preparation and as well as the mitigation phase this hazard zonation is being used apart from that we are working on spatial early warning systems also wherein we have generated a medium range uh, flood forecast model for godavari and tapi rivers so using the hec uh, hms model we do calculate the uh, discharge uh, level uh, during the monsoon season so whenever the uh, the flood uh, this thing is above normal uh, using the hec uh, hecra system we uh, do generate inundation simulation models also from this uh, we can find out uh, which districts are likely to be inundated and uh, what is the extent of flood is going to occur for each district village wise and apart from that uh, uh, it has a lead time of more than 60 hours so this is basically you can see the this thing in our portal so this is the uh, godavari basin and we can select one uh, uh, district uh, like uh, hydrographs So we can get the hydrographs uh, for it will give you the highest flood discharge of this thing during that particular date. So this initial uh, as a forecast this thing so that uh, the user will be prepared. What will be going to be the uh, flood extent? This early warning system. Similarly, in an inundation simulation, you can see on the 26 July of this year. So the uh, level was above normal. So the inundation simulation, this thing done was done. And you can see this thing and we can see the affected villages also. Yeah. So these are all the affected villages. So it will give you the, based on the percentage of highly affected area, it is uh, categorized into uh, the different colors. So, and uh, apart from that, you will have a uh, list of districts and uh, along with the panchayat and other information and it will give you the percentage of flood for each district and the village also it is given so that it will be a uh, 60 hours lead time is there so it is very useful for planning and relief and rescue operations so let's switch this. so apart from this uh, near term uh, flood hazard maps and flood inundation maps and uh, spatial flood early warning and whenever uh, there is a disasters like landslides and earthquakes also we do disseminate the near real time data through our portal so along with this uh, we have a database of infrastructure layers and administrative boundaries and hospital so along with this as a wholesome user can the user can visualize the data so uh, when it comes to the ndm salient features so these are all the uh, salient features of a national database for emergency management the very first one is the product catalog. It will give you the disasters which are occurred from past two years. As a, a snapshot, you can visualize what are all the major products you have disseminated from that this thing. User has a provision to download this in the form of PDF also. And uh, in the disaster dashboard services, we do have the alerts and warnings from forecasting agencies like for IMD, cyclones, the CWC, floods, uh, and other things. And uh, our own MOSDAC products are we are disseminating through our portal. And uh, as I already told, disaster related information of current news and social media using some automatic programs. We run this program and fetch the uh, specific disaster specific news and give it to the people. And you can have the field photographs also. And uh, we have enhanced the services compared to the previous versions are there. And uh, disaster event card from past 60 days, what kind of a disasters have occurred? And the user can visualize uh, the geospatial layer as well as uh, the, you can download the maps also. And here in the version 4, we have extended the regional language support for this. Like uh, earlier, the portal used to be there only the bilingual. Now we have uh, the portal in uh, Telugu, uh, Tamil, uh, Malayalam, and Bangla, and we are uh, extending to other languages also. So here, when it comes to data visualization part, uh, NDM has a multi scale geospatial database. For entire uh, country, uh, we have divided the data into state-wise. For state-wise database, you have the database of 1 is to 50,000 scale. For district-wise, uh, the varying 350 multi-hazard prone statistics are identified. For these data, the data is available in 1 is to 10,000 scale. 
and apart from that we have 496 class 1 towns uh, we have identified where the data is available on large scale that is only 4000 scale the data is available and apart from this vector data we do have satellite imagery to complement the vector data for better visualization we have the data from um, pipe on tape video to submit the data and here in the version 4 is concerned uh, we are experimenting for having a 3d visualization we have carried out for the assam state and uh, we have enhanced the database also with the new satellite database and as well as large scale database and uh, when it comes to scale based dynamic rendering we have a visualization from state level to street level that means total 17 zoom levels are there where the user can uh, view the view the detailed um, uh, database uh, including the uh, building footprints also user will be able to see uh, with the visualization enhanced visualization so having this kind of a database uh, this uh, we have uh, developed certain decision support tools wherein we have proximity and root analysis and multi-layer analysis so i'll be explaining the subsequent slides and we have newly developed sense evacuation tool and as well as spatial query builders Apart from that, uh, uh, there's a post disaster need assessment data based on the NIDM manual. We have uh, uh, generated this PDNA tool also in the version 4, where it is useful for uh, reconstruction rehabilitation need. And uh, we, we have developed this for 14 sectors. And we have a resource management tools for the resource allocation during the floods or any other disasters. Uh, how to track the essential commodities for allocation and reallocation. Either it could be a medical or food, or it could be uh, even human resources also, this uh, tool will be very useful during the emergency. And apart from that, we do update the portal with 12 million point of interest so that every quarterly update uh, we are doing it. This point of interest contain um, total 10 categories are there that I'll be explaining in the next slide. And apart from that, we do have mobile applications for relief management, as well as uh, attribute collections and geotagging. And uh, the entire portal is also have developed in the form of an app that is NDM Lite. So user, it is a portable for the user to uh, use this uh, entire portal in form of an app so that during the field visit, it will be very useful. And the new, this thing is offline tracking. Basically, when user is in the purview of the network, we can download the maps and uh, um, threat inundation layers or other uh, disaster specific products. And whenever he is uh, going towards the field wherein he will not have the network and this he will be able to use these maps in the offline mode also. So then uh, users have a provision to update the damage statistics during the monsoon season or during the rainy season so that uh, they can directly submit the damage statistics to MHA. This module you have developed uh, based on the format provided by the Ministry of Home Affairs. So then apart from that, we have an app of incident reporting wherein uh, this we have developed uh, after we have a collaboration with NDR people. So wherein user will be able to report an incident uh, either through mobile apps or to SMS or using the portal also. And he'll be able to even take the period photographs also for situation assessment. And uh, this, apart from that, uh, the portal is also equipped with interaction services. That is that uh, you this portal has an uh, option to uh, send an SMS and receive an SMS and it has inbuilt the email system also and he can do the data exchange, they can upload the data up to 5 MB, so that uh, it, you can call it as a one single stop for disaster management, starting from the alerts and warnings and the uh, disaster specific database and near real time disaster space based input disaster specific products. And it has a mobile app and you can send the field photographs also for situation assessment. And it has incident reporting system as well as and as a communication system so that User need not refer to different portals or different this thing. At one single stop, he can know the overall situation. So apart from that, we do have a data inventory that is IDR in database is also integrated here. So uh, that is basically to give you the information of uh, uh, relief and rescue uh, equipment which are available at what uh, place they are available, how much quantity they are available. So that as a visualization, they can do the geospatial visualization also. And we have the information about the NDRF equipment and the portal is also integrated with the census data so that socioeconomic data information is also available. And the first and foremost important is the historical database of disaster specific products. We do have the database from 1998 to till date. So it will be a knowledge database so that when you know the historical uh, this thing, how the uh, disasters uh, have occurred. So that you can use an algorithm base and you can always uh, be useful for planning and uh, 
preparation so when i was talking about the uh, database uh, this thing uh, we can categorize the entire database into base layers thematic infrastructure and uh, non spatial database in the base layers we are having all administrative boundaries are there so which jurisdiction that uh, that disasters has been occurs and uh, you have coastlines rivers uh, surface water bodies all this information is made for entire country this database is available i can say approximately 39 layers of the database is available for entire country for each state so when it comes to infrastructure layers we do have railway stations hospitals airports helipads and all river gate stations are there your dams are there ponds are there so all this information is required during the emergency management and disaster management when it comes to thematic layers basically they are derived from the satellite information so land use land cover data is there basically using this map you can find out which area got affected whether it is urban area or it is a forestry area or it is a mining area that information you will get it and you have surface water bodies you have forest boundaries also and you know the settlement points are there and meteorological data is also there slope is basically useful uh, to know that uh, for carrying out inundation simulation uh, runs so that where the uh, water flow or uh, this thing may occur and we have the data data of digital elevation model is also there and satellite data products are also available and as i was telling we have health database socio economic database all these layers are available and uh, you can see on the left hand side how the visualization can be carried out from uh, a detailed this thing from uh, this thing you can visualize the events the street names and the building footprints and uh, other uh, infra infrastructure layers which are available railway tracks in when the railway stations all this information is available uh, the visualization so this is i was talking about 12 million point of interest uh, we have categorized into 10 categories you have community centers we have uh, you have transport where the bus stops are there even the parking areas are there so anything can be useful during the disaster uh, this thing is concerned and we have health services are also there including i banks and uh, including the you know, blood banks all this information even medical shops uh, this information we do update uh, every quarterly and we have important landmarks also and financial services and recreation services so during the emergency or during the floods or any other this thing this information is very vital in carrying out the relief and rescue operations are concerned so this is what i was talking about the uh, disaster specific tools uh, so where first we have the proximity tools so using the, at one single point you can select a point either if you know the latitude longitude you can type or you can select from the map itself so that uh, you can uh, create a, a radius or you can give a buffer of uh, up to uh, 25 kilometers and you can uh, select what kind of facility you are looking for either it could be a hospital or it could be a relief shelter or it could be any other emergency facilities which is required so immediately this tool will be able to give you what are all the nearby facilities are available with the uh, on the visualization on the map as well as you can be see the from the nearest to farthest point including the distance from your source also it will be giving you user will be able to download this map in the form of pdf and take the print out as of the particular uh, report is concerned so having known the uh, source and destination now we have another tool called route analysis tool it will be able to give you the what is the optimal uh, path which is available to reach from source to destination it will give you the uh, routes into this thing one is uh, based on the time and as well as based on the distance also and user also has an option to create a hindrance suppose during the flood season and any other this thing some of the roads get damaged so if you have the prior information of those roads get damaged immediately you can create a polygon or you can Uh, intersect with the flood inundation layer so that immediately you will be able to get the order on the best alternate routes that are available in the route analysis is concerned when it comes to multi analysis tool so user will be able to add multiple layers suppose here you can see the flood inundation layer user he can draw a polygon and he can find out what is the extent of flood for that particular area user will be able to get the even statistics reports also he can get the uh, pie diagram or bar chart also Uh, indicating the in each district or village uh, how much area got inundated or how much area got damaged also so when it comes to evacuation tool so whether, whether when you have a flood inundation area or any other uh, uh, disaster specific data you have so if you want to evacuate people so basically using certain parameters uh, 
uh, first of all, it will identify what are all the villages which got affected because of that particular uh, disaster specific data. So first it will give you the list of villages which got affected. On based on the parameters like uh, what is the proximity to the nearest uh, road or what is the elevation of that particular area or based on the other facilities infrastructure are available. Based on that, it will give you, it will calculate it and it will give you some internal rankings and it will list out the best possible relief shelters in the ranking from 1 to 10. So, uh, it will be easy for the disaster management to evacuate the people uh, during the deaths or uh, any other disasters are concerned. This is a new tool we have developed. Similarly, we have a spatial query builder also. So, user, they can query or filter uh, using the existing spatial layers whether it could be an administrative or district or it, it could be an hospital or it could be any other this thing which is available in the database using the spatial query builders user will be able to get that particular area on the map as well as uh, uh, the information is also available and apart from that uh, geospatial search tool is also available where user can just type suppose if you are looking for apollo hospital and any other hospital you can just type it will fetch and it immediately it will give you uh, the uh, place where it is available on the map and if it has any attributes immediately if you right click on this particular information so it will give you where it is located what is the latitude longitude of the particular hospital suppose the uh, attributes are fed into the system so what is the specialization of hospital how many beds are there that kind of information is also can be made available in the uh, geospatial search is concerned so this is what I was talking about uh, post disaster need assessment is concerned. Uh, this thing totally we have developed it for 14 sectors are concerned. So this uh, this thing based on NADM uh, manual, we have fetched the formats and all. So user can use uh, make use of this PDNA tools uh, during the disasters. They can fill up this uh, uh, this thing. It will be very useful for the scientific assessment of uh, recovery and reconstruction needs. So I was talking about the IDRN uh, equipment is concerned. So uh, this equipment usually will be able to get there. So uh, based on the uh, type of disaster, suppose if your flats are there, you may be required the life jackets and all uh, this thing. So you user can select a particular category of the item. So then uh, uh, user will be able to get uh, uh, on the map where that uh, equipment is available, how much quantity is available. You can even find out uh, who is the contact person and where the address is there so that using uh, during the relief and rescue operations this will be more useful so resource management tool uh, so it is a basically an inventory of the uh, essential commodities are concerned so user can allocate and reallocate this uh, essential commodities and they can get generate the reports also and uh, so that it will they'll have a track of the uh, this thing total resources which are available at one single place so that for during the relief and rescue operation, this module is very useful. So apart from that, we do have the mobile apps. So one is the incident reporting system is concerned. So basically, uh, you, we have in uh, incident reporting, uh, we have tied up with NDRF batteries so that we have built in up uh, the hierarchy of approvals also in this incident reporting system. So user has a, a, a provision to even uh, to uh, get the field photographs also. And apart from that, in relief management, we have four modules. One is distress call, it is like SOS. So the moment if you just press this button, uh, the person who is sitting in the control room will be able to get the information on that particular place. The user is in need of some relief and rescue operation. So, so that the uh, disaster management official can attend to this particular uh, call. And apart from that, emergency call is available wherein uh, user is having some breathing time. He'll be able to get the, uh, means even type the information like if you want some medical emergency, medical need or food or water, uh, using the drop down menu, he can select and get the, this thing so that the information immediately will be transformed to the control room so that they can get the aid. And the next two things are done, the first information report and summary reports. So user can uh, totally give the information like how the incident uh, what is the field situation they can send the multiple photographs to the control room and finally give the summary report also and the next uh, things are concerned the geospatial data collection are there so during the non-emergency time uh, this is a option given to enrich the database 
basically so that the user suppose i have a list of 10 hospitals right now tomorrow there will be much many more hospitals to enlist the database user has at uh, this using this app uh, they can uh, geotag this particular uh, things and uh, give the attribute information also so that will be added to the database apart from that field this thing using the online maps also user has a facility to update the database so as I was telling, NDM Lite is a, a mobile app we have developed so that entire portal is uh, developed in the form of an app and uh, so that all the, uh, which is much portable and uh, uh, user will be able to get uh, the main essential services uh, in the form of this app. And offline tracking, basically user will be able to get the information when he is not in the purview of our network. So these are the main mobile apps which are developed by uh, NDM. So as I was telling, uh, we have uh, interaction services. So in the interaction services, uh, the portal has an option to send an SMS and receive an SMS also. So that uh, uh, that using that SMS listing, you can get the total uh, SMS uh, during the emergency or cyclone alerts and flood alerts and all. The state governments are basically using this SMS so that uh, immediately they'll be able to disseminate the information through this portal which are without much delay. And uh, even from the field, uh, this thing using the particular number, user will be able to send SMS to the portal also so that we can immediately act from the control room. And uh, it has, as I was telling, uh, you, user can broadcast the uh, group SMS also. So you can create in a group SMS like a uh, district wise SMS or village wise SMS. User has the option to create a group and broadcast one single uh, message to uh, one too many kind of a thing. But this particular this thing requires some moderation because it's an emergency, a disaster alert, what you are giving. In the email system is concerned, uh, user uh, have an internal email system is there without going to Yahoo or Gmail during the emergency situation. You can have a similar, is a similar to general uh, mailboxes. It has inbox and the up to 5 MB data, user will be able to upload and send it to the disaster specific people. So this portal is basically uh, uh, generated or developed for disaster management officials uh, for across the country. So that during the emergency situation, from the alerts to the dissemination, so one single uh, platform user can use a database as well as this interaction tools. Uh, so that without losing much time, he'll be able to get the information using the disaster specific products are also as well as uh, disseminated within no time. And the user has some disaster uh, specific uh, DSS tools are also available and IDRN data and socioeconomic data is also available so that it will be as a one single platform user can make use of this uh, particular portal. So as I was telling, uh, this NDM service are also extended to NDRF officials. So wherein uh, they, the data, entire data is organized into battalion ways. So in the case of battalion 10, uh, he'll be able to see the three states like Telangana, Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka. So that once he logs in with the battalion 10 uh, credentials, he'll be able to visualize the database of all the three. So that uh, sometimes disasters occur uh, during the, the um, adjacent uh, states also they are extended. So that as one single view, user will be able to see the data and uh, they have an appropriate uh, approving mechanisms also for uh, carrying out a relief and rescue operations. All these things are inbuilt in NDRF portal is concerned. And the once that incident has occurred, from incident reporting to summary generation, we have generated a simulation. Uh, uh, this thing, mock drills were also conducted and training programs are also conducted battalion based. So that during the floods or cyclones or any emergency situations, uh, user will be able to, NDR people will be able to directly take the advantage of the database as well as the decision support tools which are available in the portal. They can make use of that and they can enhance that relief and rescue operations. So apart from that, we have uh, training materials also and uh, we have brochures and flyers and mock drill exercises are also available. User can directly download these things in the uh, our uh, home page itself for this thing there is no login credentials are not required otherwise for using the database and other dss tools uh, definitely credentials are required for this particular portal so uh, we just have, we have a live demonstration of the two uh, dss tools which we have developed so this is the uh, when once you directly log into this thing this is how the dashboard looks like so we have the uh, this thing apart from the dss specific products 
we have current weather information from IMD and water level level CWC water level. Data they were I was telling about uh, uh, it will give you the gas station information where which are above normal are there which are normal which are extreme. So you can click on this information. User can find out uh, where is the danger level and what is the current water levels and uh, when is uh, what is the uh, the tendency whether it is in the increasing uh, this thing or decreasing trend. So all this information you'll be able to get it. So like that uh, you will have the, all the alerts and the warning information from various forecasting agencies. We do have landslide hazard zonation apart from that flood hazard zonation. So you can select the state also from Himachal Pradesh. So approximately it will give you the hazard zonation of the landslide. You have the legend down. Similarly, you can select other like, like that. All the disaster specific information is concerned. We have kept it one single place and we have uh, uh, cyclone tracks and information is also available. So when uh, during the Gulab cyclone, other these things. So every uh, two, three hours, we do update the cyclone track. Apart from that, we do generate the risk maps. So what are the likely areas which are going to be affected? And what are all the facilities available in those areas? Also, you can uh, see oh, Gulab Cyclone facility map. So, like this, we do generate the buffers along the cyclone track, and you can find out uh, which are all the facilities available, and you can find out which are all the villages or districts uh, get affected during these uh, cyclones are concerned. So, like that. Uh, so we do continuously monitor these disasters, but information is kept available at one single place. So when you comes down, you can find out the social media tweets also. So you can find out. So once you log in, here are all different languages. Yeah. So we do have two kinds of logins here. We have a state login where the user will be able to see the state specific database also. And if you have central login, user will be able to see the entire country's database. So I have selected this thing. The basically, once you select the state, so you will have a base data. Uh, base layer is available where it will have all the administrative layers are there. You have the forest cover is there. Surface water bodies are there. And you, as you zoom in, you will get the different kind of uh, level of information. You will be able to get it. You will know the railway tracks where they are available. You will know the point of interest where the hospitals are there. So all this information user can see or visualize. But as I was telling from straight level to street level, that information is made available for a visualization part is concerned. So all this information is very much essential during the emergency or disaster situation is concerned. So when it comes to DSS tools, uh, the geospatial US, you can see as I was telling, you have a 50,000 scale for state wise. And in that 50,000 scale, you have base layers are there, infrastructure layers are there. So you can see the infrastructure layers, you can see the air ports and all other information, thematic layers are there. All these things a user will be able to visualize. So when it comes to disaster specific data, you can select that. Uh, suppose flood is there, you can select in 2020 in this thing. So Telangana flood is there. Here also you can user can see the flood inundation layer and uh, you can see that historical data. So from 1998 to what are all the uh, information is available, layers are available user will be able to see when the historical floods have occurred and what is the extent of the flood and also that it will be very useful for the planning purpose and they can have the reports also. So when I was telling about uh, proximity analysis, I was telling, so user can select a point. Yeah, so you can give a, a buffer of uh, 15 kilometers and you can select the facility. So here he'll be able to get so which uh, this thing what is the uh, facility available and which uh, it will give you the name of the facility what is the distance what is the address so if in the database if attribute information is also added so here you can find out uh, uh, what are the information apart from that if we have a facility of I was telling you specialization how many beds are available 
whether ambulance facility is available, that kind of information also we can fade into this, this thing, framework is ready. So during the emergency situation, the database can be directly visualized. Next, it comes to a uh, route plan. So you can select uh, this thing. Source and destination points you can select, you can find the shortest route. So it will give you the two kinds of this thing. One is shortest route based on the distance. One is the uh, shortest route based on the time. So based on that, you can see, and uh, it will give you that which highways it is passing through. And uh, in each highway segment, uh, what is the time taken for traveling? All this information it will give you. Here you have an option to uh, create a hindrance or you can uh, include an obstacle also so that that particular route can be avoided. So you can select a line or polygon, or you can select a disaster. If already flood inundation is there, that this thing also you can create, or you can select a line. So it will give you what is the alternate route apart from this. So it has avoided the previous uh, this thing. It has given the new route for you. So like this, options are available. So during the flood situation, suppose that particular road is got inundated for the floodwaters. So you can get, select an alternate route also. So uh, similarly, we have evacuation plan. You can select the disaster specific, uh, this thing, a uh, flood for 2020. And uh, First, you can select the distinct. So immediately it will be giving you for those distinct, which are all the villages which got uh, affected. Initially, it will give you that information of villages. Then you can select a particular village. So, so this particular village information is given. For this village, you can find out what are the relief shelters based on certain weightages. Immediately, it will be able to fetch you the relief shelters based on the so many parameters. It's elevation, where it is this thing, and what is the proximity to road, and what are based on other facilities which are available. It will be able to give you the, uh, these are all the list of uh, shelters which are available. So relief shelter map, user will be able to download, and as well as uh, you will get a list of uh, uh, these relief shelters also. So down you will get uh, what are all the relief shelters which are available in the ranking of serial number 1 to 10 and what is the distance uh, from that uh, village also it will give you and it will give you the location also. So this is how the uh, total database uh, works uh, in uh, NDM is concerned. And uh, so here as I was telling uh, it has a, a, from starting from alerts and warnings from various agencies and it has a total database uh, from administrative boundaries to satellite data. It has uh, built in certain data support tools and near real time space based inputs are also incorporated from time to time. So, this is in nutshell. Uh, so, any uh, this thing about NDM is concerned, any queries or Thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for giving the presentation. And um, it was very much full of the knowledge and the experiences and the clarification on the website of the NDEM. And uh, thank you for the uh, putting the extremely informative and all valuable all above the session was very much valuable. And I look forward to putting up some of the techniques I have learned today into the practice, ma'am. We have few questions, ma'am. Uh, so the first one is. <clears throat> The first question is, uh, how can we differentiate between a facility map and the buffer map? Uh, uh, buffer maps means, suppose uh, based on uh, your cyclone track or something, we do create a buffer map of 10 kilometers or 15 kilometers radius around that particular track. That is a buffer map. 
generally it will give you just that administrative jurisdictions or villages which are uh, likely to be get affected by a particular disaster so when it comes to facility map apart from the buffers it will have uh, information like uh, about the relief shelters or the ranger hospitals where they are available or any other landmarks are available or so relief shelters are there and what is the uh, information the relief shelters that kind of information is available that is a facility map what is concerned it is an additional information compared to your buffer map Thank you. Uh, another question is, can we assess elevation of the existing flood bank? Um, actually, uh, this thing is, yes, we, we can assess, but uh, we need to have a, a finer uh, digital elevation uh, model data is also required for that. I think it is possible to do that. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I think we are done with the question and answer. Thank you once again, ma'am, for joining and delivering such a wonderful session to our audience. Thank you so much, ma'am. So, moving ahead towards our next technical session, we have with us the next uh, speaker, Professor Abhijit Mukherjee. Just a minute, let me confirm whether he has joined or not. Nepali, due to some technical problems, he could not join. He is in trying. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. So meanwhile, he joins us. Uh, let Short me give a brief uh, introduction to about him before he joins. So Professor Abhijit Mukherjee he is a PhD scholar in hydrogeology, graduated from University of Kanchanaburi, USA, in 2006, and completed postdoctoral work at the University of Texas at Austin, USA. He served as the physical hydrogeologist at the Alberta Geological Survey in Canada. He is currently an associate professor at the Department of Geology and Geophysics and the School of Environmental Science and Engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, that is IIT Kharagpur. Professor Mukherjee's main research areas are physical, chemical, and isotope hydrogeology, including numerical modeling, computation, contaminant, transport, water policy applications. He has published more than 100 international general articles. He serves and has served in editorial role in the General of Hydro uh, Hydrology, Applied Geochemistry, General of Earth System Sciences, Scientific Reports, ESNT, and Engineering. For his work on groundwater among several accolades, Professor Mukherjee ha has been conferred the National Geoscience Award by the President of India in 2016. Kharka Award in 2020 by International Association of Geochemists, inducted as fellow to Royal Society of Chemistry and Geological Society of America. Named as the top 50 leading scientists and experts who are under 50 years of age. He was awarded the Shanti Saru Bhatnagar Prize in 2020 that is regarded as the India's highest science award. So this was all about Professor Abhijit Mukherjee. Sir, how much time it will take for him to join? So he's, uh, he's, he's trying, actually, some technical problem. This, this Cisco APEX is, is giving somewhere some problems. So he's already in, uh, already in line and he's trying. I'm asking again. Okay, sir. Okay. No sure. So meanwhile, when he joins us, uh, let me tell something to my participants. Most of the participants are asking regarding the attendance link, feedback link. So we don't have the separate attendance link. Your attendance is being directly recorded in the Cisco WebEx through which you are joining and uh, listening our session. And this attendance, we will import the attendance from Cisco WebEx and for the, uh, this attendance will be used for, the gen for generating the certificates from our portal. So we don't have any role, physical or manual role in um, patching the attendance. It's like it's an automatic generation from the Cisco WebEx and we are directly feeding it to the generation for the certificates. And for the certification, you are supposed to have, as I mentioned at the beginning of the session, 80% of attendance is mandatory as it is a three-day OTP online training program. So every day your attendance must be at least 80%, then only you, are, you will be eligible for the certificate. And secondly, there's no, no feedback link also. Uh, the feedback link you will get after the completion of this training online training program. Once the training program will be completed, you need to go to the NIDM training portal once again. You have to log in there. And from there, you will you need to check out your enrolled events. 
and in the enrolled events you have to check for the feedback link once you fill the feedback link you will get an option of downloading a certificate download your e-certificate and that option will be working only when if your attendance as i mentioned it would be 80 percent at least at least 80 percent it's not at most it's at least 80 percent thank you please wait few more minutes uh, so that uh, professor bichit Mukherjee will join us i think he has joined professor Mukherjee, are you there Professor Mukherjee, Abhijit Mukherjee. Hello. Good Hello. Professor Mukherjee. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry if uh, I was not having some connectivity issues. Some no problem. No problem. No problem. You are in time. So, uh, already we have given the introduction professor mukherjee already okay. you have given your introduction okay, okay. now you can uh, directly go to the all stage right, and you can take your uh, participation okay okay let me find the stage yes please no problem please okay. not to be worried please take yeah. be uh, be casual right. please so uh the, so the audience are uh, like uh, teachers and uh, researchers that is a student mainly from that uh, uh, BB Babu Bhimrao uh, Ambedkar right, University right. Uh, okay. lockdown first thing second thing all over India participants are there okay. there may be the I mean uh, different uh, different I mean uh, norms that okay. is somewhere a student somewhere the professionals and somewhere professors okay. I'll, I'll just keep it uh, more general okay. okay all right so what but I request you within half an hour you'll be having the time oh, and half half an hour? okay okay uh, all right all right I'll do it accordingly. All right, I'll keep it That's fine. Um, Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Your screen is visible, sir. Oh. All right. Uh, a very good afternoon uh, to the audience, although I cannot see most of you. Um, I am Vijit Mukherjee. I am uh, a teacher of hydrogeology at the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. And uh, on uh, request of uh, Dr. Halder, I am here today. Dr. Halder has also been our alumni of the department, although much more senior than me. Uh, I have joined only about 11 years now. Um, so I'll be talking about a topic which is on interaction of uh, groundwater and Ganga systems and uh, what are the impacts and hazards that it has mutually. Uh, this presentation, um, you know, it's a modified version of a presentation that I've presented in a few places. And the work has been done with my group, which is Hydrogeology at IIT Kharagpur, as well as the Advanced Policy Advisory to Hydro Sciences, uh, where we advise to various uh, ministries of the government. Uh, the work is in collaboration with uh, some international agencies like NASA, ISA, and the British Geological Survey. So the Ganga River, as you know, like uh, it is one of the largest river systems of the world, sixth largest to be precise, and uh, it is one of the most densely populated parts of the world, uh, the, the banks of the river. So it is it is regarded as a lifeline of South Asia, and uh, as you know, like much of northern India, much of Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, it is kind of dependent on the tributaries, the Ganga itself, or the tributaries of the Ganga. So uh, I don't think I need to elaborate much on that. Um, now, because of this, there are different numerous urban centers and rural hinterlands that have developed over the last few thousand years on the bank of the Ganga River. Or in other words, the, in the present times, the Ganga River is you know, the blood and the lifeline of Northern India for sure, and mostly of South Asia. The problem is that uh, being one of the most popular rivers in the world, it has this immediate problem. 
So the growing urban population, you know, the heavy exploitation of groundwater, as well as the discharge of polluted water mass uh, to, to the river has polluted the river to beyond human consumption level. So in, in the last few decades, uh, specifically the last few years, there has been several government uh, agencies uh, who have tried in their ways to clean up the river. And as, in, as we're all aware of, like at present, the Naomi Gangri project is going on and uh, there has been effort to clean up the Ganga river. However, in today's uh, talk, I'm not going to talk about uh, the quality of the Ganga river, but more on the quantity. Now, it's, it's, I'm going to talk about a topic which is less talked about, but this is what something I understand is going to be the future of Ganga. What I'm showing you are some photographs from uh, different stages of the Ganga river during summer time that me and my students have uh, taken photographs of uh, in the last few years. And I, I suppose I don't need to say much, that like you can just see what has happened. The Ganga River has died out in many of its lower reaches, lower uh, channels. Again, once a monsoon comes in or a good rainfall, much of this water would be filled up. But in the summer times, the channels are really dried up which is something really ominous, something that you would not expect for a river like Ganga. So, the obvious question was that is the Ganga on the part of life? Now, if I have to understand this, now, I, I know like people, a uh, lot of people actually, they have been arguing that, okay, if there are changes in the Ganga River or any of these Himalayan rivers, uh, they are mostly being caused by, uh, you know, the climate change, which is, you know, the very, the easiest culprit to catch, and you can blame on it. And uh, I'm sure that climate change is doing a few things. Um, but we believe that what we are observing in the Ganga River and the drying of the Ganga River is actually related to something else, something that is not very really well understood, not very well studied and not pretty well talked about. And that is the interaction of the Ganga River with the groundwater systems in the surrounding. Now I'm showing you uh, uh, two cartoons, two, two figures, where we try to illustrate um, the interaction of the Ganga River or any river rather, any, any, any perennial river uh, with the surrounding groundwater. And as you can see that the interaction happens in two ways, either it's a base flow that comes to the river in the top figure, uh, and we call it a gaining stream. And otherwise, we have the river water losing into the groundwater system, we call it a stream flow capture. Now, this interaction, like these are two masses of water, right? Like one is a river water and one is a groundwater. So you can have interactions either as a physical interaction, so, you know, interacting between two water masses. And as these two water masses interact, you will have chemical interactions and also isotopic interactions because there will be isotopic exchanges. So over the years, with keeping this more concept in mind, over the last 10 years or so, we have done you know, a huge amount of work in the Ganga River Basin. So my group uh, have been working on the Ganga River Basin for almost last 20 years, but specifically in the last 10 years, we have been uh, doing subsurface exploration. We have been uh, doing earth observation and remote sensing, geophysics, uh, groundwater piezometry, hydrogeochemistry, pollution studies, and hydrology uh, studies. And we have been integrating all this information into big data analytics and AI to model the, the future of the Ganga River. Now, what I'm showing you is a bit complicated plot. What we are trying to understand is the observations that we have in terms of the Ganga River drying out. Is that a, just a one-time phenomenon or is this something that has been happening for some time? Now, unfortunately, or whatever, uh, the water level data of the Ganga River is classified. You cannot really get it unless, you know, there are some connectivities. So I was not able to get Ganga River data directly. We have one, stations where we do have our own instrument measuring it, 
But if we are looking at the whole of Ganga River, data is not available, at least on not in public domain. So what we depended on was satellite data. Now there are no satellite that exactly measure the level of the water in the river as of yet, although there are some satellites going out, I think, later this year. But what we have is uh, satellites which can measure the volume of water, at least on uh, surface area basis. What I'm showing you is a plot of that. Now, don't go by the color scale too much. What it talks about, it's a normalized scale, so you would not get the absolute value. What it talks about is red is bad and blue is good, which means that if you have red color, that means the water, you know, the water extent is decreasing than what the normal should be. Whereas blue means there is more water than it should have been. On the x-axis, you have the distance and we're starting from Varanasi to the Bay of Bengal. And each of these pixel width is about 10 kilometers. So we, we did this study from 2003 to 2015. And uh, what we, so each of the color bands are for one year. Now what you can definitely see that from 2010 onwards, the redness all across the river has increased quite drastically. I mean, there are some redness before also. But from 2010 onwards, the redness seems to be more, much more common than before. And we think that this is not just a one-time observation. This is not just a stray observation. But this has a mechanistic reason for this. Now, as you are all are kind of aware of and all think about that Ganga is a Himalayan river and, uh, you know, it's fed on the glaciers. Well, that is true. But that is true only for the upper courses. And uh, our studies based on geochemical modeling and isostopic analysis shows that the groundwater base flow, which is the groundwater component to the river, uh, at least in the summer times, they, they contribute to about 23% in Varanasi and up to 39% in, in, in Kolkata. Now, the fallacy here is that there is this larger component, which is called the upstream component, upstream inflow. The upstream inflow is just the water that is measured or that is just upstream of the point of measurement. So if you think that that also has the same result uh, in terms of the groundwater and the, uh, the glacial water, you, you would see that this groundwater based flow component in Varanasi would now become more close to 50% and in Kolkata it would be more like 80%. Whereas the glacial input would be more like 20% in Varanasi and only about less than 10% in Kolkata. Or it tells you that in the summer times, groundwater is the maximum volume of water that you see to flow in the Ganga River. It is not the glacial rivers. It's more of a groundwater river, at least in the, in the plains. Okay. And this is not a very unique observation. This is true for most of the big river systems of the world. So it is not just for the Ganga, but uh, most of the other rivers in the world have similar, you know, phenomena. So we, we did a lot of studies, um, uh, you know, by piezometry, hydrogenic and stable isotopes. And we, we, sh we also found out that, you know, like the river, is not always a gaining river. It sometimes become a gaining river, sometimes become a losing river, based on seasonality. So the plot that you see down below, it shows the uh, the relative hydrographs of the river and the groundwater in the in the bank of the river. And what you see that in parts of the year, uh, the river is a losing stream. In parts of the year, it is a gaining stream. So. Now, we, if we have to get a, like a gross picture of the groundwater, we need to look at some more regional scale data sets. So what we did working with NASA, uh, we, we evaluated the groundwater condition of the Ganga Basin. And uh, we, we tapped into the GRACE mission uh, that has been one of the most popular mission of NASA in, in recent times. The GRACE mission was started in 2002. Uh, with the initial plan of five years, but it's still going on. We have the next generation phase satellites going out in 2018. And uh, what what the idea is that there are two satellites, Tom and Jerry, 
and they moves on above the earth surface several times a day measuring the gravity or the gravity field of a place as they move on and the idea is that if there is a change in gravity that in a short time the change in gravity can be possibly attributed to change in the ground water mass so there these are the governing equations by which if you uh, this principle works and uh, you know like since the advent of uh, the great satellites our our understanding of the regional hydrologic systems across the world has literally changed over the last 20 years and uh, and now we have a much better understanding how the seasonality and other factors would be influencing the the, the groundwater storage across the world and for our case in Agonga Basin. So what I'm showing you is the groundwater storage change data from 2003 to 2014. What you should be looking at, sorry, what you should be looking at is this blue area uh, in in the in the north, northern Indian plains, which is the Indus Ganges Brahmaputra Basin, um, and the red area in in southern India, mostly. Blue is again good, red is bad. So what you would see that over the years, that blue has actually decreased in North India and has become red. Whereas in Southern India and Central India, some of the parts that it's become blue. Now, I'm not talking about South, South India at this talk, but what I'd like to emphasize is on the blue that became red in the Northern England plains, the Indus Ganges from over the plains. And what we are observing is that in those areas, you, you have drying off of groundwater happening. So our work got featured in NASA website for a day, and it demonstrated that all these brown areas that you can see are areas where groundwater is, you know, efficiently depleting within our study period. So along with the satellite data, we also used uh, measurement data, like ground measurement data, and we, we found out that parts of the Conga Basin groundwater is actually being withdrawn at a substantial rate such that, you know, uh, the, the water level is falling, the groundwater level is falling. Now, the thing is that, uh, you know, there are proponents who would say that such fall of the groundwater level is again a climate change impact. And uh, it's because the rainfall uh, in the Ganga Basin has been decreasing. And that's why you have all the dying event happening. The matter of fact is that we did this about 30 years uh, data crunching, and we show you that instead of rainwater decreasing in the Ganga Basin, rainwater is actually increasing in summer times. We are all talking about summer times, okay? So in summer times, rain, rainwater is actually increasing, or rainfall is increasing. So it is, you know, counterintuitive, right? If you have rainfall in, in tuting, why would the groundwater be decreasing? The only other thing that goes in the mass balance that you can possibly argue about is that groundwater is being mined out at an alarming rate such that it cannot recharge. We also you know looked at climate cycles like we did uh, hydroclimatic studies and we you know the global climatic systems like ENSO, PDO, NAO and IOD showed uh, that there is an increasing rainfall and there is a predictive increasing rainfall in the Ganga Basin. So rainfall is not the culprit. It has to be something else. So we did feed this data into artificial intelligence models and all of the models suggested that yes, in future times, as well as in present times, the groundwater depletion in the Ganga Basin is happening and it is related to the groundwater mining or groundwater abstraction for irrigation and urban purposes. Now, that's all fine, that's, you know, observation, but what is the mechanistic happening? So what we did is that we developed a, a physical model, like a physics-based flow model. And this model, the way it is working is in the, in the y-axis, the first y-axis, you have the river interactions. I mean, groundwater is going to the river or river water is coming to the groundwater system. And, and the 
uh, the right and y axis is the ground water pumping. And we, we started it in four reaches. And what you can see is that in all the reaches, the groundwater level or the river interaction is going down uh, as the pumping is going up. And the red area down below, which is stream flow capture, is where in, in years from 2010 onwards, some of these some of these reaches or some of the section of the rivers, they have actually become from gaining, which is getting this flow, to losing. You know, it is losing groundwater to the river system. Or in other words, it is just not that the, the groundwater is not coming to the river anymore. Now with a change scenario, you have the river water now going to the groundwater system. So we developed a cartoon uh, out of this observation from 1970s to 2016. And what I calculated out that about 59% of the base flow that used to happen in the 1970s had gone down in the Gonga River. And, you know, and if we can extrapolate by 2050, this volume can go down to even less than 75%. And consequently, the river water level in the summer times from 1970 to 2016 has decreased. Again, it has been incremental, and maybe people have been observing, people in the bottom floor, I cannot really say, because we don't have field data. But over the years, we believe that the river water level has decreased because the groundwater component that used to feed it has decreased. Now, if those were data and uh, you know simulations and all this thing, what is the reality? Now, I, at the beginning, I showed you one snapshot between you know one two years that we took the photographs. It just happened that uh, you know fortunately enough, I had also some older photos, you know, times when I used to do field work in those areas, and I'm showing you same areas in 2005, 4 and 5, and 2015 and 16, or 16 to be more precise. You can see the changes yourself. I don't have to. I don't have to, uh, you know, explicitly tell you about. I'm sure, like you can see, how drastically it has changed from 2005 or 2004, 2016, just in a matter of about 10, 12 years. Okay. So I'm I'm highlighting one reach, which is the Varanasi, where we have done a lot of studies in the last few years. And uh, in Varanasi, we have actually set up a natural laboratory to study these groundwater river water interactions. And what we have done is we have been studying the river pollution, river level, um, you know, the groundwater level. We have, we have got instrumentation all across the city, as well as the river. And we have been studying, you know, the river for 2014 to 2019, and we're still doing it. We also had uh, embedded a sensor in the in the Ganga River, where it was going. It was giving us, you know, real time measurement of the usability of the of the Ganga River water. We also did ge geotechnical exploratory drilling, where we kind of demonstrated or identified. Like how is a subsurface structure of our city? And here is one of the cross sections, which shows that closer to the river, you don't have a confining layer stopping any infiltration from the top or stopping any interaction of the groundwater with the surface water. We also did geophysical exploration uh, to kind of substantiate our point observation in the field in, in the uh, geological domain and try to understand you know how these you know layers the confining layers or the presence of the confining layers would be influencing the groundwater river water interactions so eventually we constructed uh, this framework kind of simplified framework which shows that there are two major aquifer systems in Varanasi and closer to the river like the river channel you see that the blue, the river channel is in direct contact with the yellow, which is aquifer, telling you that the groundwater is directly interacting with the river. 
So we also measured all these chemical components uh, to find out whether you know there are any changes in the chemistry because of these interactions. And we found out that closer to the river, you do have areas which are more prone to pollution than away from the river. Or in other words, if there is a pollution in the in the Congo River, you know, during stream flow capture or when the river water is now feeding the groundwater, you have this Ganga river water infiltrating in the groundwater, making it polluted. So even if the groundwater itself was not polluted to begin with, the river water can infiltrate from the subsurface and can pollute the groundwater. And I think this is a quite unique observation where you think the other way around, the groundwater is polluting the river water. In this very specific condition, the river water is polluting the groundwater. So I modified the previous diagram a little bit and now show how the groundwater might be polluted by the river itself. So our study got published, uh, you know, the, the drying part of the study, got published in 2018, August. And uh, in October, the government took cognizance of this study as well as other studies and issued a norm on the minimum flow of the concrete river. So I, I, I don't know like, if our work was instrumental or not, but at least it had some positive influence in the preservation of the Gonga River in terms of uh, you know maintaining the interaction processes and so on. Uh, Dr. Handa, how much time do I have? Under five ten minutes? Maximum five minutes, sir. Maximum five minutes. Uh, uh, okay. Sir Mukherjee, you may yeah. be, please <laughs> within five okay. minutes, please. All right. Uh, well. Now, this concept of uh, groundwater usage in the Ganga Basin is not a new concept, and it actually has its root, you know, in the Green Revolution. And there are some work which, uh, in the 1970s, which kind of argued that Green Revolution, in terms of what we call the Ganga water machine, might be the most possible way to, uh, to use the groundwater in the Ganga Basin. So, what it does, it 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 identifies the Ganga Basin system, the geology, as a sandbox. And in this sandbox, you have the river and you have the groundwater system. Sorry. Hold on. Yeah. The, the groundwater being in, uh, interacting with the river water. The idea is that in the summer times, you can take out the groundwater by pumping. Okay. So as much as you want and the groundwater will fall. In the early monsoon, it will start filling up. In the post monsoon, it will fill up to its origin level. So, no loss, no gain. So, the understanding is that, uh, you know, like you can, so you're basically your groundwater system is acting as a bucket. You know, you use a bucket in summer times and it fills up again in the, in the monsoon time. Now, in case you have insufficient monsoon, which is quite uh, like common in these areas, what you can do is you can go for policy interventions and go for artificial research. Now this is all fine, like theoretically. And artificial research should fill it up. The problem is that, you know, this, 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 uh, this idea of, uh, you know, sandbox model for the Congo River Basin is actually geologically not true. And we have done studies in this area for the last several years. Our transboundaries have studied from Pakistan to Myanmar, and what we observe that the subsurface of the Ganga Basin or the Indus Basin um, or the Brahmaputra Basin are not sandboxes, but they are pretty complex geologic systems. And uh, an interaction in this complex geologic system needs to be understood by proper study, which has not been done. Further, in at least in Bengal, we know that we have this arsenic pollution. Uh, but this arsenic pollution, which is mostly natural to our understanding, is further aggravated by the pumping. Like, you know, this groundwater pumping that started in the 1970s, it aggravated this pollution extent. So, the obvious questions are that is the groundwater on the verge of drying? If it dies, it will create a food insecurity by 2050. Uh, 
you know, about 100 million people would not have food in Atonga Basin. So obviously, we need to design our study properly so that uh, scientifically prudent comprehensive water management can be resolved and that can save the Ganga River for the future times. Thank you so much and I appreciate any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, sir. Um, thank you for delivering such a wonderful session on this important topic. And it was really very much interesting and incredibly useful. So we have few questions. Uh, sure. Just a minute, let me check the question, sir. Uh, just a minute, sir. Let me check. Yeah. So do, do you read the questions? Uh, uh -huh, I will read this question. Okay, so I think okay. you have directly posted to me, to the host. Okay, so okay, that's why. Okay. Uh -huh. so one question was, uh, one question is, uh, in year 2002, uh, the mm -hmm. two satellites which you mentioned, Tom and Jerry uh -huh. satellites, uh -huh. so uh, the fuel was over at that time. So what happened actually? Uh, sorry, I, I didn't get it. What happened? Uh, so the question. So the question is, uh, in the year 2002, the mm -hmm. NASA has sent the has sent the two satellites that right. Tom and Jerry, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So at that particular period, the uh, participant is asking, uh, fuel got over. So what happened, uh, what actually happened at that particular place? Um, well, if I understand the question, those two satellites were sent out by NASA uh, in collaboration with uh, University of Texas Austin and the uh, European space agencies and those two satellites the idea was that they would be observing the water mass or change in gravity in the uh, earth's, earth's surface uh, several times a day and that they have been constantly doing that for the last about 20 years uh, so I'm not sure about the what happened but what I understand what happened is uh, you know it has been spitting out very very important gravity data of the art on, on a daily scale across the world you know, for the last 20 years. And that gravity data, you can calculate out the water storage changes from that gravity data across the world for on a daily scale for the last 20 years. Okay, sir. Question the question. That was the only question which was raised by the participant. Sir, okay. would you like to ask something? Yes, Dipali, you are asking me something. Would you like some questions to Professor Mukherjee? <laughs> yes, yes, I am having one one doubt, Professor Mukherjee. Could you hear me? Uh, yeah. Actually, the thing is that from your study, especially okay. Banaras and surrounding in Ganga River, okay. you have concluded that uh, river water is polluting the groundwater. Okay. Now that one and a half year, it is the pandemic was there that pollution oh. what i feel it has been oh. little reduced especially right. in ganga ghat and entire oh. ganga river and the industries are also not running properly oh. so do you feel that uh, any symbol of reducing the pollution in the groundwater uh, number one i have not gotten any samples since the pandemic oh. started uh, so because my students are not able to go to the field since oh. uh, you know the, uh, the pandemic started um, now, again, like, yeah, there will be some reduction for sure, but uh, one thing you have to understand that this interaction of the Ganga River with the groundwater is a very slow process. So the, the pollution imprint that we are seeing today is possibly a few years, if not decades, of river water that has infiltrated through the groundwater. Because, you know, groundwater movement is very slow. So, and, and if you are looking more and more away from the river, you know, there will be more and more time required. So whatever the reduction in the pollution load in the Ganga River that might be visible in the groundwater, it will take some years before we, sh you know, we get to see that, unless it is homogenized with the older water. So yes, there is a possibility that there is some uh, reduction in the pollution load, even in the groundwater, but they might not be visible immediately, maybe in, in, in the future years. One more thing, Professor Mukherjee, that uh, from your uh, study, you have uh, highlighted that rainfall is increasing. 
Yes. Few years. But oh. the groundwater recharge is decreasing. So uh, I didn't say groundwater. No, I didn't say groundwater recharge is decreasing. I said groundwater storage is decreasing. Yes, storage, correct. Yeah. So storage so, is decreasing because it's a mass balance, right? Like how much you bring in and how much you take out. So if you take out more than what comes in, then you have like a like a negative mass. Obviously, the replacement is more due to the overburden of the population that is there. But uh, I don't know that how it could be balanced and in near future, how it could be saved. The well, there are, again, I'm not a social scientist and I have discussed a lot with social scientists and agricultural scientists. One of the problems that lies in all these areas is that the farmers, the irrigation practitioners, they actually withdraw more water than actually they need. Yes. I mean, and, and that's a common notion. And that's a, I would say, sometimes, you know, groundwater is free, right? In some sense, it's free. Uh, so if you have a way to get the pump working, you can take out groundwater. There's no charges on that. And, uh, you know, generally we have this notion, more is better, right? So whether you need it or not, that's a different question, but human greed, I suppose. So if you have a resource which is available free, take it out as much as you want. And that has been actually creating much of the problem. The water, much of the water that has been taken out for paddy cultivation and so on, actually is not required by the paddy plants. And much of it becomes evaporated out to the atmosphere. What it's causing actually is uh, recirculation or evaporation of uh, water to the atmosphere, actually causing local scale greenhouse environment. Actually, it's driving yes. local scale climate changes, which is not very observable with small data sets, but we know that it is happening. So some of these uh, changes in the weather pattern actually is being caused by local scale greenhouse effect. Now, of course, a farmer would not understand that, and it is also our responsibility to kind of make that balance and translate them the needs and what they should and should not. And last question, Professor Mukherjee, that in yeah. geophysical prospecting, I have seen that from your figure that your team is doing uh, oil logging, correct? That is good, very good. Yeah. Apart from yeah. that, any other, of course, you have mentioned that for, for the shallow water, you are doing some geophysical prospecting. So yeah. what are the uh, prospecting, apart from the oil logging, you are, right. uh, you so, are carrying out? Yeah, so the oil logging was more to understand the aquifer characteristics, correct. but we also are doing, uh, you know, resistivity profiling and, uh, seismic profiling. We okay. are using some of the most modern geophysical techniques like GPR. I showed you a figure of GPR. Okay. Uh, as well as uh, ambient, uh, um, and again, I'm not a geophysicist, but I know how my colleagues are working. So there is an okay. ambient noise-based uh, signal processing. So okay. uh, seismic then. Yeah. So basically, you know, like you don't have an active source, but you use, uh, you know, the ambient sources like you know, vehicle and other things moving on, and the waves that are getting generated because of that, uh, that are getting, uh, you know, blocked. Okay, thank you very much for thank a very so much. elaborative and nice thing in groundwater, especially groundwater phenomena, you have told, especially in Gangetic Plain, it, is a, it has to realize that what is happening and very, I mean, very exhaustive study you have, you have put in front of public. Nice. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's a really pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so Thank much you. for joining. And Thank you so much. Addressing our audience. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Dr. So Handas. So with this, we are on the verge of concluding our the first day training session of this three days online training program that is on river hazards at different uh, topographic regions and the safeguards. So I request the participants to please be uh, there uh, tomorrow also at the same time with the same link. We will be using the same link for uh, holding, the, uh, holding the our second and third day session of this three days online training program. And accordingly, as I mentioned also in the mid of the session and in the beginning of the session, please be with us and uh, to, in order to have the certificates, as I, again I am receiving the queries regarding the certificates. You have to maintain your attendance in the sessions at least eighty percent. Then only you can get the certificates. So with these words, we are uh, concluding our today's session. 
with this i would like to propose a short word of thanks um, for of this uh, training session so i i vipali jindal junior consultant in idm take the opportunity to promote the word of thanks uh, i thank uh, major general uh, mk vindal he that he is ed and idm head of our department professor suryam prakash and the vice chancellor of uh, pba university professor sanjay singh for helping and us and bridging us and organizing this uh, collaborated training session i thank uh, dr amrit lal hadar who is the convener of this program and because of him uh, the we are able to conduct this uh, program flawlessly i also thank my teammates uh, for their all time support dr harjit kaur dr raju thapa mr anil pitet mr ajit mr hari har uh, who are always there and encouraging uh, encouraging all together to complete the sessions and uh, provide the stage audience uh, flawless talks and webinars last but not the least thank you participants for making time to sit through this presentation and ask me your queries and making the sessions most interactive one please join us tomorrow see you at the same time thank you so much okay, thank you dipali Ah, Professor Dutta would like to say yeah. something. No, thank you so much for conducting the session so nicely, and I look forward to uh, meeting all of you tomorrow, eleven o'clock. Thank you, sir. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining. Thank you so much.